All right, this is going to sound much, much more like a spiritual psychology course tonight than anything else. I tried to go along much more swiftly, but uh, it didn't turn out that way. We're at page 108. Scene 5, Act 4, Scene 5. Very short scene, very long. <laughs> Not really. I'll start off and pass it to Millie. This is the laptop just before you. Would you like to read for Eva? But all my, po- my brother's powers set forth. Hey, madam. Himself in the person there? Madam, if it's such a do, your sister is the better soldier. Lord Edmund, think not with your lord at home. No, madam. What might import my sister's letter to him? I know not, lady. Uh, uh, <laughs> Faith he posted hence on serious matter. It was great ignorance. Worcester's eyes being out, to let him live. Where he arrives, he moves. All hearts against us. Edmund, I think, is gone. The pity of his misery to dispatch his knighted life. Moreover, to descry the strength of the enemy. I must needs after him, madam, with all my le- with my letter. Our troops set forth tomorrow. Stay with us. The ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Why did not you transport her purposes by word, uh, the like? Some things I know not what. I love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I had rather. Well, your lady does not love her husband. I am sure of that. And after late being here, she gave strange Elliot the most speaking books to noble Edmund. I know you are of her bosom. I, madam, I speak in understanding. We are, I know it. Therefore, I do advise you to take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked. And more convenient is he for my hand than for your lady's. You may gather more. If you do find him, pray you, give me this. And when your mistress hears thus much from me, I pray, desire her call her wisdom to her. So fare you well. If you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, preferment falls on him and cuts him off. We're not meeting tonight. Uh, Welcome to classes. What I I could, when I could meet him, madam, I should show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. Last time when we looked at. Uh, Act 4, Scene 3, we noted that there was a crack in the coalition between the sisters. And we noted at that time that it was a very good example of the functioning of the twin forces of attraction and repulsion in the desire world. We noted that the selfish self-assertion resulted in repulsion, and that repulsion between them started to correct crack their uh, union. That kind of thing is what is responsible for the Pope's statement, there is no honor among thieves. That they can't hold together because they will never honor anything because they're each seeking something selfishly. Now this scene develops it a little further and it shows another way how attraction works. On one hand, it attracts people together for a common end, for power. They both desire for power and wealth, and so they're attracted together to uh, hold that by uh, whittling away any possibility of their father taking it back. Love, in the form of desire, is also what has attracted both of them to Edmund. They both see him as a desirable bad boy, somebody with backbone that they'd like to possess. 
Now, each, with selfish self-assertion, is trying to stake a claim on him. Each is trying to say, mine, stay away. But because they are operating in the force of repulsion, that doesn't mean that there isn't any attraction. That attraction is void and inoperative. This, show, this scene shows that it really is present. And uh, its concentration is weak. But it is still there. And it actually is made to serve the ends of the repul repulsive forces. It is the force of attraction in Regan that uh, draws her right to the exact facts concerning the meaning of Edmund. The exact facts about her sister's behavior and about the notes and all of that. Now that's very true to reality. Anytime any of us operates out of the lower desire world, we can attract ourselves to whatever we want to know in our enemies. Very bad people know how to read and know a good deal. Well, they know the very weaknesses of their enemies. And that is the power of attraction. The darkened repulsive and selfish evil person is baffled by acts of pure love and can't, <coughs> and can't understand them. Symmetric way, enlightened and loving people can see right through the actions of dark evil people, but there's a big difference. The evil person just can't understand the good because it's beyond them. Not that there isn't something to understand, but the evil is just plain stupid. If no one can ever offer a reasonable rationale for doing evil because it's stupid. And so, uh, this is something that we see in our everyday life. There's a, a lot of ways that we can practically use this in our life in our spiritual aspiration, it shows that uh, no matter who we are, we can't keep hidden our flaws or our secrets or anything else. Anyone who has sufficient desire can attract themselves to know those things. And people read what goes on unconsciously inside of yourself. It also shows the futility of engaging in repulsive acts. Because you, all you do is you just get entangled in debilitating and detracting spider webs of, you know, intrigue. Who wants that? Moreover, this indicates that psychological defense or psychic self-defense or things like that are probably futile. While acting from love is always a sure thing. All right. No, you want to start? Are you up or are you Jerry up? When shall I come to the top of that same hill? You do climb up it now. Look how we labor. <coughs> and you <coughs> think the ground is even. Horrible, Steve. Hark. Do you hear the, do you hear the bee? No, truly. Well, then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes anguish. So may it be indeed. You think thy voice is altered, and thou speakest in better praise and matter than thou didst. You are much deceived. Nothing am I changed but in my garments. He thinks you are better spoken. Why, sir, here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy. Rolls and chowders that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as wheels. Halfway down hangs one that gathers sand higher, treads the trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. But 
fishermen that walk on the beach, pure white and white, and beyond all beyond tall anchoring bark an image to her cot, her cot a boy, almost too small for sight, the murmuring surge that on the unknown idle pebble chase cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more lest my brain turn and the efficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me a hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all believe the more, I would not leave a price. Let go my hand. Here, friend, is another purse. It is a jewel, well worth the poor man's taking. Fairies and gods prosper with thee. Go thou further off, bid me farewell, and let me hear thee going. Very well, good sir. With all my heart. Why, to trifle thus with this despair is done to cure it. Oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce, and in your sights shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loath part of nature should burn itself out. If Hegel live, O oh, blessed, now fellow, fare thee well. Go on, sir, fare thee well, and yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought by this had thought been passed, alive or dead. Oh, you, sir, friend, hear you, sir, speak. Thus might he pass indeed, yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away and let me. Die. Hast thou been aught but gossamer feathers air? So many fathom down precipitating, thou didst shiver like an egg that thou dost bleed. Hast heavy substance, bleeds not, speaks art sound. Ten masts of each make not the elk too which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Thy life's a miracle. Speak yet again. But have I fallen, or no? From the dread summit of this choppy bourne, look up a height. The shrill gorge lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. Heck, I have no eyes. Wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death. Yet some comfort where misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. Give me your arm. So, how is it? Feel you your life? You stand. Too well, too well. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. Born to wealth and bathe like the enraged sea. It was from the king. Therefore, thou happy father, think that observe God to make them honors of men's impossibilities have deserved it. I do remember now. Henceforth I bear affliction till it do cry out itself. Enough, enough, and die. That thing you speak of, I took it for a man often would say, the fiend, the fiend, who led me to that place. Bad flea and patient fox. But who comes here? Safer sense will never accommodate his master's, his master's voice. No, they cannot touch me for coming. I am the king himself. O oh, thou sight piercing sight. Nature's above art in that respect. There's your press money. That fellow handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace. This piece of toasted cheese will do it. There's my gauntlet. I'll prove it on a giant. Bring up the brown bills. Oh, well flown bird. Is a clout. Is a clout. You give the word. Sweet marjoram. Pass. I know that voice. Ha, <laughs> ah, general is a 
of that voice I do well remember. Is it not the king? I agree, inch of king. <laughs> <laughs> when I do stare, see how the subject quits. I pardon the man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery. Thou shalt not die. Die for adultery. No. Then go split. And the small gilded fly does measure in my sight. Let copulation cry. For Glasgow's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughter's. Got between the lawful sheets. Got between the lawful sheets. Quick luxury. Fell mill. I lack soldiers. Behold, be, behold yon simpling dame whose face between her forks uh, presages snow that minces virtue and does shake the head, to hear the pleasure of name, the ritual, nor the soil it, force goes to it, with the more riotous appetite. Down from the waist, they are centaurs, though women above all, all above, though women all above. But to the girdle do the gods inherit, beneath it, beneath is all the fiends, there's hell, there's darkness, there's the sulfurous pet, burning, scalding, stench, consumption. Five, 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 five. Give me a <laughs> <life> of <sin. laughs> Good apothecary, sweeten my imagination. There's some money for me. <laughs> oh, let me kiss that hand. <laughs> let me wipe it first. <laughs> This great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thy eyes well enough. <laughs> Dost thou squinny at me? <laughs> no, do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. Read thou this challenge. Mark the pen of it. For all thy letter sums, I could not see. I would not take this from report. It is, and my heart breaks at it. <laughs> what? With the case of eyes? Oh, oh! Are you there with me? No eyes in your head? No, no money in your purse? Your eyes are in a heavy case. Your purse in a light. Let you see how the world goes. I see it feelingly. <laughs> what? Are you mad? Man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple feet. Hark in thine ear. Change places in handy dandy. Which is the justice? Which is the thief? Thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar? Aye, sir. And the creature run from the cur? There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. The dogs obeyed in office. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back. Thou hotly lust to use her in that kind. For which thou whipst her. The earserer hangs the cozener. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. Robes and bird gowns hide all. Plates thin with gold. And a strong lance of justice curtains breaks. Armed in rags, a pygmy's straw does pierce it. Pierce it. None does offend me, none, I say, none. I'll able him. Take that of me, my friend, who has the power to steal, seal the accuser's lips. Get thee, get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician, seem to see things thou dost not. 
Now, 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 now. Pull off my boots. Harder, harder, so. Oh, matter and impertinency mixed, reason and madness. If thou wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou shalt be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee. Mark. Alas, alas, the day. When we, when we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. This is a good block. It were a delicate stratagem to shoot. A troop of horse with felt I'll put in proof. And when I have stolen upon these son-in-laws, then kill, 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 kill. Oh, here he is. Lay hand upon him, sir, your most dear daughter. No rescue? What? A prisoner? I am even the natural fool of fortune? Use me well. You shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons. I am cut to the brain. <laughs> you shall have anything. No seconds? All myself? Why, this would make a man a man of salt. To use his eyes for garden water pots. I, in laying autumn's dust. Good, sir. I will die bravely, like a smug bridegroom. What? I will be jovial? Come, come, I am king. Masters, know you that? You are a royal one, and we obey you. Then there's light in it. Come, if you get it, you shall get it by running. Bah, 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 bah. A sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch past speaking in, in a king. Thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hail, gentle sir. Sir, speed you. What is your will? Do you hear aught, sir, of a battle toward? Most sure and vulgar, everyone hears that which can distinguish sound. But, by your favor, how near is the other army? Near and on speedy foot, the main descry stands on the hourly thought. I thank you, sir. That's all. Well, that the queen on special cause is here. Her army is near death. I thank you, sir. You ever gentle guards, take my breath from me. Let not my worst spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, pray you, father. No, good sir. What are you? A most poor man, made tame to fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows, and pregnant to good pity, give me your hand, I'll lead you to some bidding. Hearty I thanks. Need. The bounty and the venison of heaven, to boot and boot. A proclaimed prize, most happy. By this head of thine was first framed flesh, to raise thy fortunes, thou old unhappy traitor. Briefly thyself remember, the sword is out that must destroy thee. Now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it. Wherefore, O peasant, dares thou support a published traitor? Hence, lest that the affection of his fortune take thy hold on thee, let go his arm. Chill not let go, sir, without occasion. Let go, snare, or thou dies. <coughs> Good gentlemen, go your gate, and let poor Bull pass. I should have been swaggered out of my life. T'would not have been so long as tis my fortnight. Nay, come not near the old man. Keep out. Chew or ye, or I say, try and wither your concert, or my bellow be harder. She'll be playing with you. Oh, dung hill. <laughs> <laughs> She'll pick your teeth, sir. Come, no matter where you're going. 
<laughs> Slave, thou hast slain me. Villain, take my purse. If ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body, and give the letters which thou findst about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. Seek him out upon the English party. Oh, untimely death. Death. <laughs> I know, I know thee well, serviceable villain, as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. What? Is he dead? Sit ye down. <clears throat> Sit ye down, Father, rest ye. But see, hark, the letters that he speaks of may be my friends. He's dead, I am only sorry. He had no other death than me. Let us see. Gentle wax and manners they must not. To know your enemies' minds, we grip their hearts. Their papers is not lawful. Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off. If your will want not, time and place will be fruitfully offered. There is nothing done till you return the contrary. Then am I the prisoner. Is dead my jail, and the loathed warmth whereof deliver me, and supply the place for your labor. Your wife, so I would say, affectionate servant for you, her own venture, her own venture, general, oh, distinguished state of women's will, a plot upon her virtuous husband's life, and he has changed my brother. Here in the sands, we all rake up the post unsanctified of murderous ledgers, and in the mature time, does this ungracious paper strike the site of the death practice, due for him as well, that of thy death dignified his head. The king is mad. How oh, stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenious feeling. From my new silence. Better I were distract so that I sh sh better I were distract, so should my thoughts be severed from my griefs, and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. Give me a hand. Far out in the things I hear the beating drum. Come, father, I bestow you with the friend. Okay, who was killed? Oswald. Oswald. Did you remember him saying he dies? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know if he was saying he <laughs> You wouldn't even need the sword to do it, Ross. All right. This is another one of those scenes with very powerful images. Blind men who can read the motives of others, provided they don't pertain to himself, and who must still trust blindly. And then we have an apparently mad king who does, who sees, but he doesn't really understand, or is just beginning to understand. Very powerful images. This is a very ironic play. There are pitiful people, but their horrible appearance camouflages profound character growth. We started looking at that last time by looking at Kent and Blind Tom and their camouflaging. This scene shows a lot character growth right within the scene. So let's look at it while we try to answer questions like, are Edgar's acts believable? And is Lear really mad? Now we've discussed suicide on other occasions, so we're not going to repeat ourselves and say those same things all over again. We want to look at the suicide that Gloucester wants to appear, or wants to do. 
There are several things in it that we can look at in a new way that we haven't looked at before. Gloucester openly states in speaking to God that the reason that he is committing suicide is because he cannot bear the afflictions which include blindness and wrongly banishing his son. Now that's a pretty common complaint. We hear it all the time. I can't bear this. I can't bear this. Edgar, in uh, the last scene, was close to saying it. And he said, well, this is as bad as it gets. We need to have it get worse. And eventually he comes to see everything as a matter of degree, and not that there is an ultimate worse for something like this. It appears to me that this kind of thinking, I can't bear it, is misthinking, incorrect thinking. Now you can say that you can't bear any more weight without injury, and you can be very correct in that judgment. That's a very different thing. The I that says, I can bear no more, is the spirit. It is the God in the making. And spirit cannot be harmed. All Gloucester has to do is to take this experience. We all endured things that we wouldn't have believed we could have endured. And we've come out of them the better. If we can't take anything, we go insane or we die. But ultimately, we can't tell when we are stressed to the max. And we can't tell when we're insane. We may have hints of it, but we can't really tell that. But it appears to me that Gloucester is saying, he says, I don't want to bear anymore. And I want to check out rather than do so. And when he does that, he's speaking more from the personal ego and not from the spiritual self. The petty ego doesn't want to bear much of anything in its vanity. It wants nothing but pleasure and it wants to revel in desire. But it doesn't want to bear anything. Now this is very common thinking for a suicide, and I've found a lot of times that potential suicides say, I can't bear this anymore. What they're really saying is, I'm too good to bear this anymore, and I'm going to exercise my option of checking out. When the sun is in a common sign, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius or Pisces, that is often the signature of someone who is weak, both in ego and in the incarnation of the spirit. It is also a quite common signature for suicide, especially if the sun is in Virgo. In this case, both Greer and Gloucester seem to have something like a strong Jupiterian influence, maybe a Sagittarian influence. Both try to be big men, be generous in their generosity, they try to make everybody happy, and both are a bit shallow, and they only see the surface of things. They're both careless with their generosity, as you'd expect from somebody Jupiterian. And they're both puffed up. These are interesting matters, but there's something much more interesting for me in all of this. And that is how Edgar deals with it. These are questions that come to mind are the actions of Edgar believable? And why would he take such actions? Edgar.
Ginsburg tells them they're going up a steep incline when they aren't. And Gloucester doesn't even feel like he's going up a steep incline. But on the other hand, he doesn't protest. Edgar tells him he can hear the surf, but Gloucester can't hear it. But at the same time, he can hear that poor Tom's voice has changed and the way he speaks has changed. Edgar tells him he must be all messed up. His blindness must have messed up his other senses, which is just the opposite of reality. When one sense is diminished, the others are heightened. And Gloucester, at that, persists in his perception about knowing that uh, blind or poor Tom has changed in his voice, but he doesn't protest anymore. Then Gloucester tries to throw himself off an imaginary cliff and nearly falls down. Edgar meets him as though he were somebody else at the base of the cliff, and he tells him of the mighty fall that he had at the hands of some kind of terrible fiend. And finally, he tells Gloucester that gods must have preserved him to have such a fall and to have not died. And Gloucester doesn't know what to make of it. Do you? I really don't know. I'm not sure about the whole business. The first thing I think is to note is the change in Edgar's speech. When he's speaking to his father, his speech is very graphic. He especially describes in images that appeal to the visual imagination that you see every day. When the man gathering the herbs on the side of the cliff is no bigger than his head, that's something you can immediately see with the inner eye. It's right in your mind's eye. It seems that Edgar realizes that his father is newly blind and disoriented and not yet used to the blindness so that he can uh, trust himself in anything. I have a friend that's blind that hugs walls and has not the confidence of knowing that if I take this many steps, I'll be at this place in the room. And that's something that is, you know, in the early stages that happens. Alster realizes that he's very vulnerable and he needs help to even commit suicide. So he can't protest and be left all alone and helpless because he doesn't even know where he's at. Edgar is using suggestion through imagery. I've been put through suggestion by imagery where I think I've seen things that weren't there. I had them suggested to me when I was in a vulnerable state. And I saw them. That could be a very, uh, that could be a very powerful technique. I can give you an example. It's what kids do at camp. They pick somebody and they bring them to the campfire. They tie their hands to their feet after having pulled their pants off. And they show them the fire. They've got an iron rod in the fire, heating up to be red hot. And they tell them that uh, they're going to give them the camp brand. That they're going to take that poker and they're going to run it right down their leg. And they're going to make an arrow. And they heat it up, and they heat it up, and they, they tell the person, well, just so it isn't too bad for you, we're going to blindfold you. They have the person blindfolded and gagged so the counselors don't hear. And then they take and they put an ice cube on the leg and run it down the leg and then the person feels the blood running and everything else. And it's a, it's a panic kind of situation. And all because the images have been suggested to you. 
What? What camp did you? I didn't attend a camp like that. <laughs> <laughs> you were with a girl. So, jeez, I'm glad. <laughs> In the early days of jazz, Paul Whiteman had one of the first jazz violinists playing in his orchestra. His name was Joel Benuti. He had the subtlest kind of practical jokes that he played. And Joel Benuti roomed in the hotels at night with a blind piano player. And when he didn't have anything to do, he would shave off the bottom of the chain, I mean, just one little shaving, and for several days he, he wouldn't do anything. He'd take one more little shaving off, and eventually the chain is shorter. And Joel Bernoulli has the nerve <laughs> to tell the blind piano player, "I call it George. I think you're getting taller." <laughs> <laughs> successful at feigning madness, but his observers, the people around him, aren't skilled enough to know the difference. I think a lot of people could feign madness and not know that, and have people around them wouldn't know because nobody knows. Not many people are psychologically trained. The funny thing is that Edgar is successful anyway. Gloucester is a very believing man, and he's willing to doubt even his own senses, even though they seem to be functioning pretty well. First of all, he believed Edmund, who meant him ill, and Edmund even gave him convincing evidence. And he was too careless to check that evidence out. Now, against all evidence, he believes Edgar, who means him well. And again, he fails to check out the evidence. So he's more than just physically blind. He's convinced that he doesn't know whether or not he has fallen from uh, a height of ten ships' masts. He says, have I fallen or no? What seems really amazing about this is that it works. Because on line 77 he says something really remarkable. He says, henceforth I'll bear affliction till it do cry out itself enough, enough, and die. Now this isn't unbelievable to me. This part of it isn't anyway. It shows great psychological insight in the part of Shakespeare working through Edgar. In an earlier talk, in an earlier play, we tried to demonstrate that suicide is archetypically ruled by Virgo. That is, when one goes from should I commit suicide to how can I commit suicide? That is a big change. Virgo is very methodical to the point that it makes method of mania. So once it gets into that mental track of how am I going to do this, it's almost an unstoppable juggernaut. Some people have committed suicide by driving spikes into their skull. Some people have committed suicide by chopping their head open with a hatchet and they had not the strength really to do it. It took a lot of work. My stepmother, when she was a little girl, nine years old, her mother committed suicide. And she thought she 
got the notion in her head that if you commit suicide, you do it by drowning. And she ran cross country a mile through barbed wire fences and everything to throw herself into a river to drown. <laughs> when, you, when you get that set in your head, Edgar apparently is wise. He doesn't even try to dissuade his father because if he did, the argument, with the, the trying to dissuade him would only fix the argument more firmly in his consciousness. You know how it is with people. You try to argue them out of something and it only makes them stronger about it. What he does is he plays along with him and he brings him a different kind of experience. Now, this remarkable experience with the suggestion of gods and a demon opened him, Gloucester that is, to a totally different kind of outlook on life and on himself. It isn't just he alone suffering this. The gods and the demons are involved. So instead of protecting his petty ego from pain, he sees himself of worthy, of being worthy to be saved by the gods. And he decides to be faithful to that worthiness and to the gods. Even uh, the demon gives him, gives him an out so that he doesn't have to uh, place all the blame on himself. This is very practical. The practical thing to do is to distract and not to challenge a suicide. The best thing you can do is to find a way to bring that person, male or female, to experience life in a different way and not merely in the set way of thinking that they're looking at it now. Once again, I don't know whether it was well executed or not, but Shakespeare seems to come through with a very good understanding of how to deal with something like this. Now, this scene is very rich, and this part of the play seems to be very good for asking questions. So, let's ask another question, or re-ask it, and look at an auxiliary question along with it. Let's re-ask, is Lear really insane? If so, is Shakespeare's portrayal of sanity true to nature or not? As far as we've gone, Shakespeare has been psychologically correct in portraying the onset of mental illness. First, there was the obsession with the treachery and unfaithfulness of his daughters. He couldn't get it out of his mind. And he was fighting with the reality of it. He probably didn't want to admit that it was happening to him. It was always a large part of insanity. Then he progressed to rage because the psychic energy had no place to go. Then, since he was not doing anything constructive or creative with his life, the energy took the unused imagination, which would normally be a useful thing, and started applying it to uh, fantasy. That's as far as we got last time we looked at the unrealistic fantasy of him. Now we see a new development, several new developments in this scene. In his speeches at line 83, 86, and 109, he makes a big deal of being a king, of being born a king. Probably, this is in part again, egoism. When he makes a big deal, of being a king when the fact is that he is no longer a king it gives the whole thing a tone of delusion 
it's beginning to sink into him that he really isn't somebody special in worldly terms. And he doesn't want to live that way. His ego won't allow it. Like Gloucester, he doesn't want to bear that fact. Acceptance is so much easier and so much simpler to proceed forward from than fighting the fact or fighting the reality. So, he tries to make something important of himself by saying that he's a king because he was born a king. So far as this goes, it is psychologically correct. Delusions on the part of someone who is doubting the ego of nature and feels that they're a shit or something like that but doesn't want to admit it, delusion is a very common thing. But there are some things that are a little questionable. At line 89, he throws in some unexpected non sequiturs. Especially when he starts talking about a mouse and he wants to go at the mouse with his sword. In an earlier talk in this series, we mentioned psychodeterminism. And that works in such a way that we cannot say something completely meaningless. And even if we do try to babble out something meaningless, what we really do is say something about our hidden psychological nature deep down within. Everything that we say and do is logical, psychological. However, we can't ignore the fact that mentally ill people make some very strange non sequiturs. In the mental institutions, the psychiatrists call it crazy talk. They ignore it completely and they try to forbid the patients from uh, using crazy talk. That's probably a mistake, but it is a tricky issue and it requires a good deal of skill to handle. If one plays along with it, one gets into the same morass that the patient is in. That gets pretty sticky pretty quickly. If you try to engage it carefully and objectively, it can lead a therapist to the issue which is impossible for the patient to get across, get beyond, has been able to work through or has been able to work around. This crazy talk is a subjective language and it's very personal. So is the language of a poet, a very sensitive poet, who goes very far in one direction by the end of his career, only a few people who have followed, just like the psychiatrist, can follow that poetry. Now some of what is crazy talk is in fact anything but crazy talk. And it is the pathway to getting at the real problem. At first, when Lear speaks of a mouse at line 89, it doesn't appear to be that kind of a lead. He speaks as though he really is seeing a mouse. Perhaps he is seeing a mouse. If that is true, his condition has deteriorated so far that he's dissociated uh, at least partially from his physical body, and he's seen things pass through the inner world, such as mice. Perhaps it's Shakespeare trying to unsuccessfully portray mental illness without understanding psychodeterminism. With Edgar, as poor Tom, it's easy to see that he's faking mental illness. He's such an honest straightforward guy, he can't even feign convincingly. Lear's condition is not quite so clear. There's another possible meaning for the mouse. 
male and female pubic hair, as well as the penis and the pudendum, have been called mice. It may seem absurd, but it's really worthy of consideration. If you read this scene very carefully, you notice that from this line, from this speech at line uh, 86, and from the seeing of the mouse at line 89, for the next few speeches by Lear, there are a lot of sexual references. You have to read very carefully, and you have to look at the notes in the book, which is why I suggest taking the books home. But this sexual language is street language, and it's a little bit obscure, but it's typical for Shakespeare as far as being slang about sex, but it's not typical in another way. Normally, Shakespeare uses sexual references in humor. And the sexual references, not always, but usually come from the clowns, comic characters. In this case, the sexual language is from the king, and it's not at all funny. You look at it, the statements are a bitter rejection of sex. And they're even tinted with misogyny. Because of his daughter, no doubt. One can see then that he has come to see things in the world in reaction to his daughters. But that's not the point we're trying to get at. The point we're trying to get at is the rejection of sex itself. Sex is a very potent force. It's what keeps all species, plant, animal, humans, keeps them all in continuance. And all species put their very best stuff into sex. The best proteins go into it, all of the best. A rejection of sex without transmutation of the energy in sex is symptomatic. And it's dangerously symptomatic. As spiritual students, the spiritual component of sex is what is interesting to us. In some schools, it's described as a spiritual fire. A fire that is seated in the sacrum and it rises up to the area of the larynx at which point it spreads out around the cranium to form a fiery flower shaped thing. That is of course if the person has transmuted the energy and has turned it upward into higher things takes that beautiful form. Some people it only gets part way up the spine. When one turns up the sexual energy in loving creative activity, one develops creative organs and creative powers. The mind becomes working through the brain becomes a creative power Eventually, the voice box will allow us to give words of power to heal and make new forms and things like that. So what we're dealing with when we're dealing with sex is something very, very powerful. In the dense body, there are two sexual centers. One at the sacrum and around the genitals. The other at the uh, skull and the larynx. Mystics who can look at long periods of time in our spiritual evolution claim that this divided center 
is temporary. It's temporary for the time that we are here in this dense physical world and need to use part of the creative energy outwardly for, for creating new bodies. And part of it for turning upward to evolve spiritually. When these two centers become united again in our spiritual future, we will be thoroughly creative spiritual beings. We will be gods. Small g, of course. But there's another kind of centrality that we're interested in. In all of the fluids in our bodies, there are physical components and there are higher, more spiritual components. For example, the blood is not only the physical substance, the plasma and the hemoglobin and such, it is also an etheric substance, a spiritual gas that is responsive to the spirit. Similarly, in the physical sense, there is a cerebral spinal fluid, but it's not the spinal fire. Within the fire, the spiritual best of everything real within us is manifest. It's a universal principle that the creative stuff of a cell is in the nucleus, in the center. And in the center, all of the creative and controlling and spiritually best is there. In the case of the spinal fire, or the spiritual energy, it doesn't have to be a center like a nucleus of a cell. Centralization in the spiritual world is very different than it is in the three-dimensional spatial world. It's just central. There is a desire component to the spiritual fire as well as an etheric and a physical part to it. And it is very important also. The fire is not a neutral colorless fire, it is alive with emotion, and it's alive with desire. Depth psychologists have a name for it, and uh, they're not even aware, most of them anyway, are not aware of the cerebral spinal fire, the spiritual fire. They call the desire portion of the spinal energy or the creative energy, they call it libido. And libido is a lust for life. And it's very potent. It is this very libido that is first misplaced in Lear when he goes into a rage. Then it is misplaced into uh Fantasy at another time. Come on, hurt anything you can go. Oh, okay. When the libido or the spinal fire with the libido is uncontrolled and undirected or misdirected, it can wreak all kinds of havoc in our inner constitution. It's almost like letting off a fireworks rocket inside of a room. It can, it can wreak all kinds of uh, destruction inwardly. That is what causes the breaches that we described as insanity in the previous talk. Accompanying every major illness, mental illness, there are two major symptoms. One is extreme egoism. Often it's very specific. This is what causes the divine 
full of energy from the spirit and the divine part of our being to cease to flow through us. When we have to have things our way and when we become closed, the spirit can flow through us and we are spiritually unhealthy. The other major symptom in mental illness is some kind of severe sexual problem that causes a misdirection of the libido or the spinal fire. Now, Sigmund Freud was the first to exoterically point out the sexual component uh, both in neurosis and in psychosis. Nowadays, most people consider him to be too extreme in that uh, focus of psychoanalysis. Among the people who actually read him and what he really said, you find him to be quite a genius. I think he's a genius, but not for making that observation. I think he's a genius for his intuition as he knows how to apply it through observation in ther therapeutic things. Because this observation was easy. Anybody who goes out to any ward at Menorah Mental Institute and you're there for five minutes, you can make that observation. The majority of patients have severe and obvious sexual problems. It doesn't take a lot of work to find it in the other ones that have that are there also. So at this stage, when Lear downs and denies sex and even vilifies it, and vilifies the object of sex, women, it's a sign that he's in serious trouble. He's not transmuting or redirecting that energy. In his retirement, he just wants to idle. And he wants to sport without discipline, without responsibility. That's not a good way to conduct your life. You have this drive, this lust to live. And then if it has no place to go, it will go wherever it wants to go. And that will probably be the pain place of least resistance. Our weakest spot. So when his daughter cuts off his expression in idle sport, it seems to emasculate his ego. And the libido is let loose even more. And it's just a terrible thing. It's staring up a party inwardly. That storm that he was talking about is a real storm. Now, in fairness to his daughters, who are no sweethearts, but in fairness to them, with this style of living, some of these problems might have happened even without their nudging. If a person doesn't take care, that's what's going to happen. If this is what Shakespeare intends by injecting sex with this kind of attitude into the character of Lear, it's brilliantly insightful. Some of that crazy talk is not like the crazy talk of mentally ill, but it might be asking too much of a playwright. It's only a play, after all, for a playwright to produce the subjective language and to produce a whole history of a psyche so that the crazy talk makes sense. Audience probably wouldn't even get it if it did. So as far as, I, as I'm concerned, Shakespeare, for being an amateur with no pretensions to psychology, to psychological knowledge, does magnificently in this. As we pass through these speeches by Lear in this scene, other things come clear. At 109, line 109, there is a long speech where he projects his puissance, his delusional puissance, and he downs women. He's 
not completely delusional and ranting with crazy talk. He isn't in the boat either. The thing is that he speaks vehemently and forcefully. He doesn't know about the treachery of Ed, Ed, Edmund, and he misspeaks in praise of him, which surely should put Gloucester off. But what happens? Gloucester wants to kiss the hand of the king. This is again very insightful. It shows that Gloucester is very suggestible, especially if the suggestion is placed forcefully. So maybe it wasn't so unbelievable that Edgar was able to, to do this with him. It also shows that he needs a strong king, because if a person is suggestible and impressionable like that, uh, that goes along with not being strong and seeking out somebody who is. So this is also uh, psychologically correct. Then there is the magnificent speech at line 159. It's filled with worldly wisdom, beautiful words, and insight. This is the speech that causes Edgar to marvel at the mixture of madness and wisdom in the same improbable man. Of course, this raises questions again. Is this true to reality? Or is Shakespeare just using the so-called madness of Lear to slip something past the aristocracy that he might not be able to slip past in any other way? Or to slip it past the politicians? Whether it's true to life or whether it is a device, it is a sign of tragic growth. A difficult things to look into. I don't, you don't want to believe the amount of time I put into this this time. This is one of those scenes where I went to Cape again and it was just, you know, it was like popcorn going off in my mind. This speech, this device, is not only true to reality, in my opinion, it's likely. I think all of us have heard very wise things from troubled people. I have. I have a friend who is a psychiatrist, and he related to me the story of a patient he had that was in a mental ward, and the man was advising scientists at NASA. And he wrote to the scientists and told them, do you know that you're dealing with a man who is a schizophrenic? They didn't care. They were getting the information that they want. And he started working with the patient, and the patient started to respond to treatment, and the more he responded to treatment, the more he lost his insight into science, much to the chagrin of the scientists who still kept posing questions for him. From a mystical point of view, this kind of mixture of madness and wisdom has several explanations, or several possible explanations. For example, a simple one is is that even being slightly withdrawn from the physical, just so you're just slightly out of perspective, you can become attuned to the ethers. And you can be in touch with the mass of the information that is there. I've had it happen a lot of times with, with people who are mentally ill that could read all kinds of things out of my consciousness just because they were more attuned to the inner worlds than they were to the outer. doesn't mean that they were psychologically healthy, but it, in some cases it, it was even a battle of wills where they tried to do what they wanted to do. Well, 
with Lear, I think there's something else that's going on. It has probably been a long time in coming. The egoistic lore of nature has been cornering more and more control of the personality. Enough so that it can freeze out the higher nature, the spiritual self, from controlling. Eventually, when the general psychic constitution has little spiritual impulse, input, it gets in trouble. The lower nature has cunning, but it doesn't have wisdom. All it really wants to do is satisfy its own desires and live on the excitement. With the desire for pleasure without responsibility, it makes decisions that are extremely unwise, like the decisions that Lear has made. When stripped of power given to him by convention, his ego of nature, even though it's strong in controlling the personality, is really weak because it doesn't have the spirit backing it up, and it loses control. We see all of those crazy things that we're trying to understand. Beyond that, we now see something more. With the stranglehold of the lower nature broken, the higher spiritual self can start to come through. However, due to the damage done in the breaking of the grip of the, of the ego, the self has only a partial ability to get things through. Hence we see the egoistic ranting on one hand, I'm a king, every inch a king, and on the other hand, an insightful wisdom. The question then becomes, is this tragic growth of character, or is this just a serendipitous a uh, side effect that has little, that's a little bit of compensation for a life failure. And the answer to that depends on the scope of vision. I, perhaps with spiritual and mental greed, prefer the largest scope of possibility. I would say that it is tragic growth, even if insanity is the price that the spirit had to pay. The truth must out, the spirit must dominate, no matter what the cost. Soul growth is much more important than comfort or pleasant circumstances. Of all the blunders, psychic and otherwise, that I've made, the spirit has not only let them happen, it seemed to have empowered and encouraged their, their occurrence. That's in everything in my life, when Freudian slips to major life mistakes. Surely, the divine part of us, the spirit, would much rather have efficient growth by working together with the pain lower in nature. But experience is far too important to pass up just because the lower nature is uncooperative. It has only these few years here and the, here and the spirit is going to take advantage of every moment of them. Even the handling of the lower nature is too important to pass up. What seems to have happened with Lear, and it's not uncommon, is that the spirit has given the ego enough rope to hang itself, or to harness itself. This is how the spirit works. It's positive. It lets us make asses of ourselves and then it changed the asses. It 
may seem monstrous, but I believe that the Spirit would actually precipitate and endure mental illness if that was necessary for growth, and that was the only way to humble the lower nature. So this is both tragic growth, and it is a serendipitous side effect of tragedy. It had to be this way for the growth to take place. The Bible tells us that with God, a year, uh, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. So if it takes a whole life cycle, a whole thousand years, before the full growth can take place, be that as it may. Funny thing is, is that Lear is even aware, or is becoming aware, of his condition and how he is incapacitated in his condition. At line 192, he says, I'm cut to the brains. Now, before we leave this scene, let's look one more time at the character development and growth of Gloucester as he grows in this scene also. When we last looked at him, he resolved to stand there and take anything rather than escape by committing suicide. If we look at his last speech in the scene at line 283, we can see that this resolve has served him well. He's made some progress, but not a whole lot. Sometimes I wish I had made that much progress in a lifetime he made within one scene, but still not a lot. He's still very self-conscious, and he's very impressionable in reading the king. However, by seeing the madness of the king, he begins himself to become compassionate. And he realizes that his compassion is not enough. That's often the case with compassionate people. Once they start becoming compassionate, the floodgates are open and they never believe there's enough compassion. In some cases, it can even lead to uh, excess and self-indulgence if the person identifies with compassion. It seems to do this to some extent with Foster. He's not grown so far that he hasn't gotten beyond self-pity, because in the speech at 283, there's self-pity in there. He still wants to squirt out the side rather than stand in there and face everything. But now he would rather be mad like Lear, like Lear seems than to be suffering as he is. That's a common illusion that people have about insanity. They think that because a person is insane, and they're not completely with it in this plane that the spirit is not suffering. And that's not so. It's like sitting on the bench. You're on the sidelines. You can't get in there and play. That's great suffering. So he would rather do that than grow himself, even though he is growing with uh, having more compassion. And at this point in the scene, or at this point in the whole play, because of the sensitivity he now shows and the suggestibility and the compassion and especially the escapism, he seems to be a little bit more now like a Pisces than the Sagittarius. Because uh, he's got all of those qualities. He's still careless like a Jupiterian sign would be. All right, let's quickly uh, read the last scene. Next time we have a hope of uh, perhaps finishing the uh, running commentary. You're up, aren't you? Oh, you're up. All right. <coughs> I would, I would have you anyway. 122. 122. Oh, now, good Kent, how shall I live and work? To match thy goodness? My life will be too short, and every measure fail me. Be acknowledged, madam, is ordained. All my reports go over the mind of truth. And the more I work with, the soul. Be better suited these weeks our memory of those worser hours our duties have been. Pardon, dear madam. 
yet to be known shall end by me being found. My brethren, I think that that you know me now, that I am in my Father's heart. Let it be so, my good Lord. How does the king? Madam, sleep still. So please, Your Majesty, that we may wake the king. He hath slept long. Be guided by your knowledge and see, and the rays fear of your will. Is he awake? I'm, Madam, and the heavens sleep. We put fresh garments on him. Be guided, Madam, and that you awake him. Very well. See, she is drawn near. Loud is the music there. Oh, my dear father, respiration hang, the medicine on my lips, to let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Find the dear princess. Had you not been there, father, these white flakes would challenge the real death. Was this a face? Holy Lord, the Lord King, to stand against the deep, red bolts of thunder, in the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross lightning to watch poor Hugo. With this thing hail, mine enemies, dog, though he had bitten me, should have stood that night against my fire, and wast thou fain, dear father, to have hobbled thee with swine and goats? In short, I must have straw, for lack to lack, to wonder that thy life and this at once is not complete at all. Be wake, speak to him. Madam, do you, uh, as prince, how does my royal lord, how fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul and a lip, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that my own ears do scald like molten lead. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. Where did you die? Still, still, far wide. He scarce awake, let him alone a while. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight. I am mightily abused. I should even die with pity another to see another thus I know not what to say I will swear these are my hands let's see I feel this pinprick what I were assured of my condition oh look upon me sir and hold your hand in benediction on me you must not kneel pray do not mock me I am a very foolish fond old man Four score and upward, not an hour more or less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. He thinks I should know you and know this man, yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant. What place this is, and all the skill I have, remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for I am as a man. I think this lady to be my child Cordelia, and so I am, I am. Be your tears wet? Yes, faith, I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause, they have not. No cause, no cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. And yet it is danger to meet him even o'er the loss, the time he has lost. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more. He'll further settle it. Will please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you now, forget and forgive. 
and an old approach. Hold it closer to the drape to the blue cup on wall to the Swiss name. Most certain, sir. Who is the conductor of the people? As to said, the bastard son of Gloucester. They say Edgar, his banished son, is with the Earl of Kent in Germany. The report is changeable. It is time to look about the powers of the kingdom that hold the pace. The arbitrament mint is likely to be bloody. Very well, sir. My point and period will be thoroughly locked. Or well, or ill, as they say, well, or. Let's see. Cordelia's <laughs> opening speech complements some of the things that we've been saying all along. People who look for the good become booked good, and in turn, they see more good. Gloucester has grown to see new things and to become a little bit compassionate. But he still wants to leap out. Cordelia sees the good in Kent and wants to be like that. She is sort of self-forgetting. She's unprepossessed. Or she's pre yeah, I'm prepossessed. She would have to, she would uh, like to live in the honesty and forthrightness of Kent, even though she does quite well on her own. So she compliments. In her speech at line 89, this complimentation continues. She compassionately understands her father's suffering, and she loved without trust, protestation. She's thoroughly positive. At line 45, Lear has a very potent speech. It has two items of importance, and only one of which we will look at now, and the other one we'll look at later. Dixon, in Greek mythology, was a prince. He wanted to marry a princess, and he promised her father big gifts as a dowry, and he invited him to a banquet in order to receive those gifts. And he took his bride with him. And when her father came, her father fell into a pitfall, and coals underneath him was burned up by them. The lesser gods wanted to punish Ixon. And uh, they wanted to punch him severely. But Zeus, for some reason, liked him. And he even invited him to dinner in uh, heaven, which is Olympus, at the top of Mount Olympus. Ixon came to that dinner, and he came prepared to seduce Hera, the queen of heaven and the wife of Zeus. Zeus read his thoughts, and he made a fake Hera out of the ethers. Yet, he was seducing her, Zeus came upon him and exposed him. He called Hermes, and he told Hermes to scourge him, to beat him, until he repeated the words, Benefactors deserve honor. And he did that until it was repeated. And then Ixon was tied to a burning wheel. Same image of a burning wheel that Lear speaks of. This is a huge positive image in Lear, and it's going to come into our study of cause and consequence when we get a little further. This is a little sideline. The child that was born from the Ethere Terra and Hickson was named Santaras. He was kind of odd and he had a fascination with magnesian mares. And on the magnesian mares, he sired all of the centaurs, including Shire for <laughs> That's just a side one. We're not going into that. <laughs> Among other things, this myth of Hickson 
He has an initiation myth in deep disguise. In fact, in the Egyptian initiations, the initiate was crucified on a cross on a wheel of fire, and the wheel slowly turned like that as he became the uh, inner consciousness of uh, the initiatory work. King Lear might very well be an initiatory story too, but we don't have time for that right now. The reference to this image is important to us in what we're looking at right now because it seems to indicate that Lear himself has become clear enough in his spiritual insight that he recognizes his own ingratitude. Despite his delusional, egoistic statements about being the king, he underneath he realizes he has an ingratitude. His own benefactor, human and divine. And it's as though the suffering of the ingratitude of his daughters had brought him to see his own ingratitude. That is a huge step of growth. If you can quit blaming others, even when they have treated you unjustly, and see <coughs> what's going on in yourself, that's really very important. It's the best growth of all when we suffer it, when we take it to heart and become more self-responsible. Now, if you think that's a stretch, read his next speech at line 59. Pray, do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man, four score and upward, and not a year more or less. And he says in another place, uh, you must bear with me. Pray you now, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Now those are statements of honesty and of humility. He realizes he still has problems connecting to the world, but he's not blaming other people, and he is in a way saying, even with his destroyed psychological nature, mentally ill people rarely ever think they are mentally ill, even when the psychiatrists do the very best all the new <laughs> so he has come to a partial healing and a real tragic growth with the perfect antidote to egoism. He has come to humility. The damage may be too severe for full recovery, but it's wrong. To make this kind of growth is really a tremendous thing. Next time we'll try and finish the uh, whole last act. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do this weekend. <laughs> Thank